so it's my pleasure to uh, give a second version of a talk I gave yesterday to uh, the physician and uh, PhD investigators. Um, I will attempt to make this understandable, happily for me. Uh, much of our data are not in the ozone. It's sort of uh, well grounded in exercise physiology and I think uh, perhaps understandable. So we'll attempt to make it more so here. So we have a, a technique at Harvard and the Brigham and Women's Hospital called the Invasive Cardiopulmonary Exercise Test, which many of you may know about. Uh, we found it incredibly useful in the investigation of all forms of exercise intolerance. It, it's been around for about 30 years. Um, for the first 20, it was largely dedicated to <clears throat> investigating early heart disease, early pulmonary vascular disease. But as you'll see here, slowly along the way, we recognize there is another uh, subset of patients affected with exertional intolerance uh, whose uh, cause is elucidated well by this type of testing. I have no disclosures. So a quick table of contents for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll explain to you some of the details of invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing, aka CPET. Uh, I'm going to try to build a case that some of what ails our patients with ME and long COVID uh, is in the category of neurovascular dysregulation. So this is a bucket category which suggests that the autonomic nervous system is dysfunctional and in a secondary fashion, blood vessels are poorly controlled during upright exercise uh, and symptoms ensue. I'm going to briefly touch down on the notion of mitochondrial dysfunction. There are other experts that you'll probably hear from today, uh, better versed than I, but we have some preliminary data on this. And then finally, I'm going to touch on something that I think has been largely ignored in ME, but I know um, affects a substantial subset of patients with ME, and that's shortness of breath with exercise or the upright position. And um, I'll tell you about some of our notions about what my, might underlie that. Uh, quick call out, a shout out to a place that uh, existed, believe it or not, before me, and uh, it's the Harvard Fatigue Lab, and I find it a bit ironic that it was named the Fatigue Lab, and all this has come back around in a, in a fashion. So here we are um, more recently. This is in the basement of the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, we do about uh, 10 tests there and 10 additional tests per week at a satellite facility, again, for the investigation of all forms of exercise intolerance. About half of them now, though, uh, for patients with either ME, CFS, or long COVID. Uh, give you a quick tour of what we do here. This gentleman agreed to be uh, filmed. So we got a small village surrounding the patient. It's an upright cycle ergometer, and as you'll see as we go along here, it's incredibly important that we test the patient in the upright position. So I bet most in the audience know that about orthostatic intolerance, and if we do these things supine, meaning lying down in a cath lab, we miss all of the signals, virtually all of the signals. Um, so the basic part of the test is the mouthpiece in this gentleman's mouth. Uh, it's measuring uh, minute ventilation by a pneumotachograph, and then the uh, little wires coming out of the pneumotachograph are measuring expired pulmonary gas exchange, CO2 output and O2 uptake. Uh, what's special about the invasive test is the two catheters. Uh, there's one in his right internal jugular vein placed by one of our interventionalists in the cath lab around the corner from the exercise lab. Uh, it is kind of the heart and soul of the test. Without that catheter, we really get no inferences about what ails the patient. We cannot interrogate the interior of the patient, as it were. Uh, we get nonspecific findings. Uh, the other critical catheter is in this gentleman's left wrist. It's a radial artery catheter. It enables us to look at blood pressures throughout exercise, but additionally, from both catheters, we sample blood gases and lactate and a variety of biomarkers, which you will hear about hopefully in another day. Uh, don't be overwhelmed by this. This is a um, uh, sort of a simplified version of our diagnostic algorithm that comes from this type of testing. I'll just hit on a couple of highlights here. Way at the top, many of you know, 
Uh, it's the time-honored measurement of impairment. So we can take any individual with symptoms during exercise and quantify the degree of impairment with the VO2 peak. So this is the, AKA the VO2 max, the maximum oxygen uptake. We express it as a percent predicted. The normative values are based on the patient's age, gender, and assessment of the body size or lean muscle mass. Um, I will tell you that many patients, most patients with ME-CFS and long COVID come in just mildly impaired. So that number will be 70% of predicted. And if you stop with a non-invasive test there, you may conclude that what you're dealing with, as many in the audience know, uh, is simple detraining or deconditioning because that is the range that simple detraining can get one to. But in this case, the use of the catheters tell us much more, and they tell us that it isn't simple detraining. I'll come back to that. Um, we have the ability to rule out a lung limit to exercise, so-called pulmonary mechanical limit uh, to exercise, uh, and uh, that uh, is denoted here. We don't see much of that in ME or in long COVID unless the patient with long COVID has been on a ventilator with ARDS and fibrotic lung disease. The rest of the world is explained over here, and it's all about oxygen flux from the environment all the way out to the mitochondrion and the exercising muscle. And we can really drill down on the determinants of that. So there's oxygen delivery. This is cardiac output. Uh, this is the oxygen content in arterial blood, and we're directly measuring these two things. And I'll tell you to cut to the chase, these things are normal largely in MECFS and long COVID. Uh, there is an abnormality here that I'm going to come back to. Um, we can rule out left heart disease, heart failure. We can rule out pulmonary hypertension. I won't get into those things, but it's useful to rule these things out as we assess patients with unexplained exertional intolerance. Uh, where our patients with ME and long COVID land are these two buckets, and I'm going to spend the rest of the time telling you about them. One is low filling pressures. We call it preload failure, remember, in the upright position, and the other is a peripheral phenomenon whereby there's abnormal oxygen extraction, especially at peak exercise. Uh, I'm a lung doctor, and I guess that's a disclosure. Uh, I got into this business about seven or eight years ago. Uh, really, with this paper, Will Oldham was the first author, uh, and this reflected a growing appreciation that many patients that we were seeing with unexplained exertional intolerance, including dyspnea, which is breathlessness, uh, were coming to us and they were not explained by any intrinsic heart or lung disease. So we pursued this a bit. We did so by uh, looking at our invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing database, uh, which was then about 600 patients. And we determined there was a subset of individuals uh, who didn't have intrinsic heart or lung disease but who were compromised by something called preload failure. Uh, and that's low filling pressures, uh, particularly in the upright position, all of this is upright, and even more particularly at peak exercise shown here. So these are the right atrial pressures. They reflect the blood flow coming back from the periphery. Normally there's some sympathetic tone and the big veins squeeze down properly and prime the pump and there appears to be failure to do so. And I will make a blanket statement here. I don't think it's hyperbole. I have not yet met a patient with bona fide MECFS or long COVID who doesn't have preload failure. This is ubiquitous. It's quite common. Um, so here, here they are defined in this paper but on the right side of the heart and on the left side of the heart, this is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate for the left atrial pressure. And then we attempted to link these low filling pressures as you move right to left here at peak exercise to time-honored CPET variables, uh, which include the VO2 peak and the peak cardiac output, and there's a relationship. So in this subset of patients compared to a uh, cohort of normal individuals who had some complaints but we couldn't find anything wrong with them during this testing, um, preload failure appeared to compromise VO2 peak via cardiac output. So, um, we learned in retrospect, and a slow learner as a lung doctor, Dr. Davis, um, that many of these patients um, met uh, IOM, the old IOM criteria for MECFS. So this really launched our investigations into this. So this is where they land in our, our bucket. Remember mild impairment here. 
can't see any of this without the catheter. Um, it's not to say it's for everybody, but for the investigation of this, uh, this is helpful. All right, so my interim summary is that in MECFS, preload failure uh, is ubiquitous and it leads to a depressed VO2 peak and presumably symptoms. We took a little deeper dive into this with the same technique and a larger database uh, now numbering uh, roughly 800 patients um, and two summers ago. And uh, the lead author on this was Philip Joseph, who is now at Yale, shown in the upper right. And what we did was uh, borrowed heavily from the POTS literature. So a lot of this has overlap with POTS and dysautonomia. And we divided uh, blood flow uh, VO2 slopes. So this is the relationship between uh, cardiac output and, and read pulmonary blood flow, which is what we measure by the thick principle during our type of testing, divided by the VO2, and we divide it into tertiles here and compared to a normal cohort. Uh, that normal slope has been known forever to be five or six ml per ml. And what we, um, what we determined was, like POTS in the upright tilt table test when blood flow is measured, there is a low flow group shown in the blue, and there is a high flow group as well, and then there's this intermediate group. Uh, so we looked at, so this part was sort of intuitive based on the Oldham paper that I showed you. This is a low flow group failure to prime the pump and that depresses the VO2 peak shown over here. Uh, but this high flow group was interesting and a little bit different. Uh, so shown here in, in the red is um, that version of their cardiac output of VO2. So this is the high flow group. And the hallmark of uh, these patients' abnormality they have preload failure, but they additionally have this problem with systemic oxygen extraction. So normally during exercise, when we all uh, do incremental exercise, cardiac output goes up about five-fold, and then it's the job of the autonomic nervous system, uh, the traffic cops as it were, to um, modify the resistance of the arteries, the arteriolar resistors, and redirect blood flow properly to the exercising muscle. Uh, so when the autonomic nervous system is dysfunctional, that may not happen. Uh, when that doesn't happen, blood flow goes to organs that doesn't need it, that don't need it. Uh, that can include the skin and include the gut and include the kidney. These are organ systems that are usually deprived relatively of blood flow during um, intense exercise. So we think that's what's going on here. And what results is impaired systemic oxygen extraction. Um, we took a little further dive into this because initially, anecdotally, we uh, were aware that many of our patients with MECFS would be diagnosed with a small fiber neuropathy by skin biopsy in the Oaklander lab at Mass General. And then we began, began to systematically do this testing. We asked the question, of all of these patients with MECFS and this preload failure, uh, and additionally a subset of patients with this impaired oxygen extraction on the arterial side, uh, what was the prevalence of small fiber neuropathy by skin, skin biopsy. For those of you who don't know about small fiber neuropathy, we've known forever that small fibers are ubiquitous, they're throughout the body, best studied probably in the skin, which is accessible by biopsy, and they mediate pain among other things, the C fibers, but uh, they also have an autonomic function both sympathetic and parasympathetic. So uh, we diagnose it by the neurite density, specially stained, uh, the epidermis of the skin. And what we found was nearly half, not quite, either had definite or probable small fiber neuropathy when they had preload failure and MECFS. So it's quite prevalent. And this is a similar number to fibromyalgia and a similar prevalence to that described in the literature in POTS. We attempted to marry the skin uh, biopsy neurite density to the physiology and failed woefully here. So we're a little bit disappointed by this, but um, we have some thoughts about it. So these are neurite densities. Real abnormal folks are back here to the left uh, in the same patient population. And then we've looked and attempted to regress uh, peak exercise VO2, peak cardiac output, extraction of oxygen, and then the filling pressures on the right side of the heart. And it's a scattergram. 
So I think um, the take-home message here perhaps is that the anatomy is not, does not describe all the physiology. We know we've got a decrease in nerve density. The ones that remain are probably dysfunctional, maybe even overactive. So on the pain side, that's fibromyalgia, and perhaps on the dysautonomia side, these things contribute, but the anatomy doesn't fully explain it. Uh, so based on the Philip Joseph paper, we additionally described this as a cause for uh, depressed VO2 peak, shown up here, and that's impaired systemic oxygen extraction, at least loosely related to the presence of small fiber neuropathy. Now, we've begun to think about this as neurovascular dysregulation, despite the scattergrams that I showed you a second ago, in part because of this paper. So Philip Joseph, again, was the first author. We published this in Chess last summer. It's one of the cardiopulmonary journals. And we asked the question, if we used a drug uh, that's been around forever, FDA approved for the treatment of myasthenia gravis, pyridostigmine, uh, which is known to increase the acetylcholine concentrations in the neural synapses and the, uh, between the uh, uh, motor neuron and the end plate of the muscle, which is how it works in myasthenia gravis. If we use this drug, which has been used in POTS for many, many years, uh, could we get a signal that suggested the nature of the disease? So we're using this uh, drug, which we found useful clinically in the clinic longitudinally, but we're using it acutely here to try to get at some inferences about the nature of the disease. So in this particular study, we had 50 women, uh, and I'll just say this, um, no offense to the guys, the males seem to be a bit different in terms of their response, and more on that on another day. Uh, but uh, we focused on roughly 50 women. Uh, it was placebo-controlled. They pedaled away, uh, did the initial clinically indicated invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test, and then they received placebo immediately or drug, and the drug was 60 milligrams of pyridostigmine. And we asked them to pedal again about 50 minutes later. S same lines in place, they just recovered. Uh, and some interesting things ensued. The effect size is readily, admittedly, small, but uh, it was concordant and therefore statistically significant. So if the patients got active drug compared to placebo, their VO2 peak was higher on the second exercise test. And the question was how, and with the catheters, we're able to determine that it was higher because the cardiac output was higher and um, the right atrial pressure, the filling pressure was higher. So we think pyridostigmine improves VO2 peak and presumably symptoms over time, at least in part, by tightening up veins, by improving venoconstriction, and priming the pump more properly. Uh, we can work backwards and suggest that this suggests that at least a subset of patients uh, with MECFS has exercise intolerance related to a neurovascular dysregulation. So this is where we would put all this together here. In MECFS, we have both preload failure, very common, if not ubiquitous, and then a subset of patients with peripheral left to right shunting associated with small fiber neuropathy uh, and the suggestion that this is all, not all, but perhaps mostly neurovascular is that it corrects with pyridostigmine. Um, so we're going to shift gears briefly to COVID, long COVID. So this will be uh, the type of patient who does not have intrinsic heart or lung disease by all of our usual things, pulmonary function tests, echo, uh, chest imaging after they survive their acute COVID. So this is the majority of patients with uh, long COVID. Uh, and we took a look with a very similar approach, and this will look frighteningly familiar here, just displayed a slightly different way and published this last uh, summer or two summers ago. Uh, so the invasive CPAT, we had 10 patients with, uh, who survived uh, COVID. They're at least six months out. They have no intrinsic heart or lung disease, yet they have exertional intolerance. And we compared to uh, 10 normal controls. So small numbers, but I think there's a theme here. Their VO2 peak, like most of our patients with MECFS, is mildly decreased, 70% of predicted, with some variance. Their pulmonary blood flow, the cardiac output that we measure during the invasive CPET, is frighteningly high and uh, very close to uh, those of the normal individuals. But notice the disconnect between VO2 peak and cardiac output peak. This is a hallmark of left to right shunting. 
lots of pulmonary blood flow that's ineffectual and not getting to the skeletal muscle mitochondrion. And as a result, there's impaired systemic oxygen extraction, which is roughly half of normal. And here's the preload failure with probably a type 2 error because of small numbers, but the hint that we have preload failure. So it's it, almost exactly the same in our world as ME. And this is where they land, uh, just like ME. And this is our conclusion, additionally, for long COVID, at least a subset of these patients. I'm going to switch gears uh, briefly to mitochondrial dysfunction, which is a fascinating area and woefully understudied in ME and in long COVID, but I think has the potential to be a contributor to exertional intolerance in some of our patients. So these are ME patients. We did this study immediately pre-COVID. Um, we took poor extractors, this is shown over here, uh, by the invasive CPET with MECFS. Here are their VO2 peaks. You can see there's a range, some of them mildly depressed and a couple others a little more severely depressed with a VO2 peak. We did uh, skeletal muscle biopsies of the thigh, frozen, sent to Baylor, where the electron transport chain was analyzed. And additionally, what's thought to be a global marker of mitochondrial function or dysfunction, and that's citrate synthase activity, and that's shown here. And perhaps to our surprise, uh, 10 of the 11 patients came back with evidence of citrate synthase deficiency. So we think this is an intrinsic problem with the mitochondrion, although it's been pointed out by some smarter people than I in the mitochondrial business that perhaps this could be the effect of poor O2 delivery. In turn, I would say that's a peripheral left to right shunting problem. Uh, so this is where they land. I just remind myself that poor oxygen extraction as a reason for a depressed peak VO2 uh, can be explained in some patients by mitochondrial dysfunction in addition to the peripheral left to right shunt. I think this is super important going forward because uh, the treatments for mitochondrial dysfunction, presumably acquired, not genetic, uh, are very, very different from those of the dysautonomia and the vascular dysregulation. So I think this is deserving of much more research uh, and potential treatment. So I would add to the list of here of things that contribute to exertional intolerance, the potential for mitochondrial dysfunction. All right, the last category of things that I wanted to describe uh, to everyone is the notion that shortness of breath in both ME uh, and long COVID uh, is there in a subset of patients. And we have some insight into uh, its pathogenesis. So a classic non-invasive way of describing something related to shortness of breath physiologically is a lot of minute ventilation, that's VE, divided by the amount of carbon dioxide one is excreting at the mouth. And when it's high, its build is inefficient. But I'll tell you that not all high numbers of this uh, fraction uh, are related to ineffi true inefficient breathing. So in the uh, Indy Singh paper I just presented a second ago, uh, we had a measure of ventilatory inefficiency, and in fact there was evidence of this that was statistically significant in our 10 patients with long COVID compared to the normal controls. Now, uh, this is some higher pulmonary physiology, but I'll remind myself and everyone that a high number uh, physiologically can be explained by one of two things or both. Uh, so one is hyperventilation during exercise, driving the arterial PCO2 down too low, more than is necessary from the lactic acidemia that occurs during exercise. The other is truly inefficient breathing. This is physiologic dead space divided by tidal volume. Uh, and that's wasted ventilation, and that's usually part of parenchymal lung disease, COPD, uh, interstitial lung disease, which these patients don't have. So uh, what we did here was directly measure this physiologic dead space to tidal volume ratio and the tendency for hyperventilation. And the short answer is all of this is explained by hyperventilation, whose genesis is totally unknown. We don't know why patients hyperventilate. I have a suspicion that there's a signal from the periphery, an unhappy periphery, uh, which is uh, perhaps neurally mediated. More on that, we're looking to study exactly that uh, and then potentially uh, help guide treatment. So it's all about hyperventilation, is not about truly inefficient breathing. 
This is what we have found in long COVID, and I think the same thing uh, happens in uh, MECFS. Uh, others have jumped on board this train. We've got the Cleveland Clinic here with a statement a couple summers ago uh, that shortness of breath is part of preload failure. And then we've got our friends, the Europeans, uh, suggesting the same thing in uh, long COVID. So this was the last uh, category of things I wanted to talk to you about. Now, one thing I am asked all the time about, and it is so appropriate, um, because I know where our patients are coming from. I see them in clinic, and they are told repeatedly by uh, healthcare providers who are not in the know, you're out of shape, it's in your head. Um, and uh, it's distressing, of course. So one of the contributions I think many in the audience have made, and that we hope we've made as well, is hard endpoints, physiologic endpoints, to prove that these things are not in your head. So in my world, I know that this preload failure is not related to be being deconditioned or out of shape. In fact, it goes the opposite way. Uh, and this was a representative um, paper by one of our Canadian colleagues, Dr. Stickland, who did upright invasive CPET years ago and looked at the effect of deconditioning versus conditioning. So shown in this upper panel is right atrial pressures during progressive incremental cycling exercise in the upright position, and here's the surrogate for the left atrial pressures, the deconditioned patients go up higher and they go up earlier in exercise. They don't have preload failure. It's the opposite end of the universe. So I would suggest uh, preload failure not made up and not due to deconditioning. In a similar fashion, the group of patients with impaired systemic oxygen extraction uh, cannot be explained in my view, by detraining. And this was a classic paper by Ben Saltine, one of our Scandinavian cousins. Um, and uh, it's a classic paper where he took eight marathoners, put them to bed for eight weeks, let them get up and go to the bathroom and nothing else. So this was a classic study of detraining, conditioned to detraining over about eight weeks. And he did replicate invasive CPETs. And here was the uh, summary of the extraction issue, and that is that at several stages of fitness as they get progressively impaired, the decrease or the impairment of um, extraction of oxygen in the periphery is minimal. It is not the major feature of deconditioning. So our two major findings here, preload failure and in a subset of patients, largely women, impaired systemic O2 extraction are not explained by detraining in our view. Uh, special thanks to many people, uh, a couple of them in the audience here. Johanna Squires, who's going to be a PhD, whether she knows it or not, and Sarah Elzair, uh, who is applying to medical school, a Cornell grad, have uh, made huge contributions most recently to all these things. Mentioned these folks, Arabella Warren actually, uh, has contributed substantially. She just got accepted to Cambridge to go to medical school in the fall. Kristen Madsen is in uh, Copenhagen doing the same. And then uh, there's an MGB, Mass General Brigham Consortium, a special call out to someone you may know of, uh, do the late Dr. Ron Tompkins, who is near and dear and really established all of this. Wenzong uh, Xu, who's one of our fabulous statisticians, Peng uh, Lee, both in the audience, Ron Davis in the front row. Peter Novak, one of our uh, neurologists. And a, one last special call out to Open Medicine Foundation who's helped us and Linda Tannenbaum who is here. Uh, I will pause and see if we have any questions. And these are two recent additions to the family. Thank you. <laughs> questions for David? Yep. Hi, Neil. This is slightly off on a tangent, but I just wondered whether, obviously, the major the symptoms in women are different. How how might your findings have an impact on labour, and might there be? You might not know the answer to this, but thinking about safe birthing positions, safe guidelines for women in pregnancy. What might your findings show or suggest for that? 
Okay, I think I caught the latter part better than the first part, okay. safety and pregnancy, yeah. um, for sure. So yeah, <laughs> pregnancy is a challenge for many patients. There's a little bit of yin-yang going on there, though, and some in the audience may know there are many autoimmune diseases. Pregnancy can be unpredictable. Some patients actually get way better, and if some of that small fiber neuropathy is autoimmune, as we think it is, Perhaps some of the patients actually get better during pregnancy related to that, but others get worse. Uh, so a potential autoimmune component to it. But from a hemodynamic standpoint, um, uh, the uh, gravid uterus, especially in the third trimester, is a bit of a challenge. So it compresses the inferior vena cava, and presumably uh, and symptomatically the, the, these, the symptoms are compatible, can um, worsen the preload failure. So uh, the problem is some of the drugs that we use, which are borrowed from the POTS literature, uh, can't be used in pregnancy, at least they're not deemed to be totally safe. Uh, so unfortunately we have to stop pyridostigmine. We don't use the old POTS medications, fluoronef or imidadrin. And what we do is conservative measures. So we do uh, venous compression, stockings, uh, augmented salt and water intake. And um, I've had probably a couple dozen patients who have gotten through their pregnancy with variable degrees of difficulty, but have been able to do it. Um, safety issues, yeah, I mean, it's kind of common sense. We have to be very careful with uh, orthostatic intolerance, and we don't want patients syncopizing. It's not a verb, but we use it, um, fainting, um, banging their heads. So we do everything we can to mitigate the uh, orthostatic intolerance. Hi, uh, just a quick question on the, um, I don't think I'll risk trying to say the drug, but the, the drug that approved the VO2 max, uh, and you tested on 50 women, you just mentioned at the outset that there was something different but, uh, in terms of the reaction of men to exercise. I'm just curious, even at a high level, you might not have time to get into detail, but just at a high level, why wasn't that applicable to men or what, what's the difference with them? Right, um, so we don't know. There was a nice talk yesterday on gender differences. Um, and I think uh, a potential link to estrogen metabolites and uh, vasodilator, vasoconstrictor, yin-yang, uh, perhaps even how blood vessels behave. We've got another disease in our business, which is pulmonary hypertension, which is a disease of young women. Um, the, it's been loosely linked to some of the estrogen metabolites and their effects on blood vessels, in that case, the lung blood vessels. So we don't know, um, but the difference that we have observed kind of simply put, is that guys tend to have the preload failure without the left to right shunting, and women are way more predisposed to the left to right shunting and impaired systemic O2 extraction. But, but we don't know the reason we're investigating that. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Down the front, Richard. Giving you a workout today, Richard. Yeah, again. Hi, David. Um, is there any, you've done the um, trials on mestinon short term in the laboratory. Is there any long term studies on mestinon? The reason why I ask is I'm a um, post Lyme disease, chronic fatigue, dysautonomia patient. I'm also a biomedical scientist in the NHS as well in the UK. But I've had a really good clinical response to mestinon, and I've got it. Um, Prescribed by, you might know him, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, the York cardiologist. And he said interchangeably, he treats a lot of POTS dysautonomia patients. And the conversation that I had with him, he said he's not, he wasn't sure whether chronic fatigue ME was dysautonomia or dysautonomia was chronic fatigue ME. Based on the big clinical response he tends to see using pyridostigmine. I've noticed, I've been taking it since November. Um, it's been one of the biggest game changers for me in my illness. Um, my PM is severely reduced. Um, and my brain function is in incredible in comparison. My, my sleep is much deeper, <coughs> more refreshed, so I'm out of that vicious circle of poor sleep and um, feeling fatigued in the day, so I'm getting refreshing sleep, so I have a better day and better functioning. Still have to lay down every day at lunchtime, but for, for me, 
and to look at particularly severe patients in ME, it's been such a game changer. Fortunately, maybe because I'm female, so I've had a, a better, better response. But I also feel as well, because it's a parasympathetic enhancer, it's really balanced up my sympathetic and, and parasympathetic, so I'm not producing as much adrenaline. And as we know, adrenaline uses 10 times more energy, so then I'm not eating into my energy, so I'm not getting the post-exertional malaise because my mitochondria is, is reserving my energy. So it's just, for, for me, it's one of the big drugs that I've personally seen. I've been very so fortunate that it's working for me. It's so nice to see longer trials to help, really help other people in my situation. Yeah, yeah. So um, thanks for the comments, and we're delighted you've had a response. Uh, in the clinic, I've had um, uh, a lot of similar stories. Not everyone, don't want to overstate it. Uh, yeah. There's a spectrum of responses and timetable. Um, we have That's two things going on that. to answer your question about chronic treatment. Uh, one is a retrospective look uh, at patients who receive pyridostigmine versus other usually POTS drugs uh, over time. And I think the preliminary signal from a little baby metabolic CART test that we do in the clinic called a SHAPE study measures many of the same things as the non-invasive portion of the CPET, um, is that uh, things get better for the majority of patients compared to other modalities. The mechanisms by which mestanon works chronically, so we have a little insight into the acute dose, single dose, you know, with uh, what I just presented, but chronically there may be more things at play, and I absolutely agree, uh, perhaps increased parasympathetic tone is a good thing, it can tamp down inflammation, could be immunomodulatory in the end, we need to study all that. Uh, quick shout out again to Open Medicine Foundation and Linda, who's here in the audience, we um, have organized, it's not quite ready for prime time, a prospective clinical study. It's going to involve pyridostigmine as one arm, uh, low-dose naltrexone as a second arm, and then a third arm will be the two in combination, all versus placebo. So four arms followed over three months with replicate non-invasive CPETs. Uh, so we've just organized that, and I hope to be able to answer with biomarkers uh, the pathogenesis, how it works, when it works, what dose. So thanks for that. Yeah, great. Uh, question up there. Hello, sorry, just going back to basics. Fascinating talk. I just would like you to explain, please, how the measurement of the oxygen extraction happens, because you're talking about internal jugular vein, but obviously when there seems to be no problem in the normal blood that's taken from ME patients. So how does it actually no, th work, th please? Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I did not fully explain that component. So the access of the pulmonary artery catheter is the internal jugular vein that I pointed out in the movie. Uh, the tip ends up in the pulmonary artery. So what we're, what we're in a medium-sized pulmonary artery. So what we're measuring with blood gases is mixed venous oxygen content. Uh, so the extraction is the classic comparison between arterial oxygen content and mixed venous oxygen content. And we correct for the hemoglobin, which is, can arithmetically affect that number by dividing by the hemoglobin. Okay. So it's different in there, but by the, so by the time the oxygen comes to here, you know, there's no difference when they measure. So um, it, the, it, with exercise, they're very different from regional changes, say, in an antecubital venous catheter. The, this tip of the catheter in the pulmonary artery reflects whole body metabolism, and about 80% of the cardiac output at peak exercise is coming back from the exercising muscle. So it really, it's a pretty good reflection of what's going on in the muscle. To get even more specific about that, you can put in a femoral venous catheter and directly interrogate the limb, uh, but that isn't so amenable to exercise. Okay. And just another quick technical yeah. question. Preload failure, is that not enough blood going into the heart? Right. <laughs> so I think uh, the cardiologists uh, would remind me and do continuously um, that true preload is uh, stretch on sarcomeres of the heart. So it's uh, dilation of the heart at end diastole, kind of priming the pump. We've got an indirect measure of that, uh, so it's preload is not entirely correct, um, which is the pressures feeding the heart. But 
uh, all of our patients with ME, I should say most of our patients with ME and long COVID, uh, the types we're studying, have normal intrinsic diastology of the heart. So the pressure is a pretty good surrogate for preload. Thank you. Great. You're welcome.